Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first ever episode of The Data Heretics with myself, David Langer, Joe Reese, and Ku Ping Xiong. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun today. Um, oh, before, before we go any further, please let us know where you're watching from and what time is it at the moment um, from your location. Um, but yeah, really, really excited to have all of these amazing people with us today. Um, maybe it's time for some introductions, perhaps. Let's go from, we'll, we'll start with Dave. Hello, everybody. My name's Dave Langer. Uh, I'm a LinkedIn spammer, as a lot of you probably are aware. I also got a little YouTube channel, and uh, I like to talk about data, and I have a particular heretical bent about how to do data and analytics. Very good. Very, very good. And we'll go with Joe. Hey, what's up, everybody? So I'm um, Joe Reese, um, sort of a LinkedIn spammer, not as, uh, not as awesome as the others, but getting there. Um, so yeah, uh, recovering data scientist. Uh, I run a company called Charnary Data. We're based out of uh, Salt Lake City, mainly focused on data architecture, data engineering, and uh, helping companies build a solid data foundation. So. Awesome. And Ku. Cool. Hello, everyone. I'm Ku. Cool. You can call me Ku. Cool, uh. no, no need the full name. Just call me Ku. Cool. It's, easy. it's easier. So I'm from Singapore. Uh, so I do uh, training and consulting on data science. And uh, during my free time, I read up a bit on uh, artificial intelligence. So yeah, that's what I do. Awesome. And you should introduce yourself as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll, I'll introduce myself as well. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. Uh, my name is Danny. Um, I find free courses on Udemy and I share them on LinkedIn um, <laughs> amongst, amongst some of the other things that I do as well. Um, I'm, I, I run Sydney Data Science, which is my company, which I was running a few um, consulting contracts through. And I'm currently running the Data with Danny community, um, which I think we're almost up to 600 people now, which is amazing. And people are really enjoying it. So please check it out if you guys need. Um, but yeah, I think let's jump straight into it. For, so for this session, what we're going to do is probably um, to, to cover off a few data myths. And I think as data heretics, we're probably the perfect people to bust them and debunk them and kind of provide you an alternative perspective uh, from within the data trenches. Because I think for all of us, we've spent quite a lot of time working in quite technical roles, as well as working with the business as well. So I think we can we can provide you perhaps like a different perspective on some of these um, myths. And then, yeah, so we'll just start with here. And I think every now and then I'm going to pause and we'll try and go to one of your myths in the comments as well. So just be ready to drop in your favorite myth that you want us to debunk anytime. And I'll try and read it as we go through. So let's start with this one is from Ku. You don't become a data scientist after a program or several courses. Okay. Cool. Oh, All right. so I've got that. <laughs> okay. Uh, then let me let me let me start first. Well, well I think first thing first is uh, let me go with my definition of what data science is in the first place. So I would say data science is more of like um, how you can derive. It's, it's about how you can derive value from business value, especially from uh, data. Um, so interesting enough, yesterday I had another discussion on another forum. Uh, so while we were talk, they were actually discussing about which program to go to uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. But I, I thought I, I chime in in that discussion and say that um, no, I think first thing first, yes, you want to select the best um, program. I, I think there's nothing wrong with that. That's human nature. Uh, but you have to realize that what you are doing is you're just learning. Um, the analogy I like to give is that you're just learning that, hey, this is what a hammer does in the toolkit. This is what a spanner does in the toolkit. This is what a screwdriver does in the toolkit. Uh, in most of the program, that's what they do. And they'll tell you that, oh, if you see this problem, then you use this particular toolkit. But unfortunately, I think in the real world, right, I think all of you will, uh, will know is that, hey, it's more of like the... Uh, stakeholders come over, boom, this is the data, solve it for me, uh, solve it for me. And that's about it really, right? So that's, a, that's, that's the difference, that's the difference between that, that what, you, what you see in the causes and what you see 
in in the real world so i so i kind of feel that no you have to be able to demonstrate that you can you can provide that value first uh program is a good start not saying that it's bad um but you then have to be able to provide the value uh with that in mind yeah mm, definitely uh, dave mm. what are your thoughts on some of the programs and courses as well does your do you echo these thoughts i do i do and for example like you major in computer science either at the bachelor's level or the master's level you still aren't a software engineer as soon as you get your sheepskin right so this isn't just data scientists this is like all kinds of technical positions right you really have to like get in the in the muck in the trenches and actually experience all the things that actually happen uh <laughs> in the real world and one of the things that i do post about occasionally actually quite a bit about on linkedin actually is sql i am amazed for how many of these programs for example don't teach sql so realistically if you're going to be a data scientist out and you're coming out of school and you don't know how to do sql no mm -hmm. right and that's okay though people shouldn't be turned off by it that's just the reality so just say look i'm going to study i'm going to learn the tools like ku was saying and then when i get out in the field i'm going to learn some more stuff and i'm going to learn some things that they didn't teach me in school and that's just that's just the natural way of things Mm -hmm. Definitely, Joe. What are your What are your thoughts yeah. on this? First? I kind of agree. Like, uh, I mean, data science it's a full contact sport, right? So, <laughs> I mean, programs and courses. It kind of reminds me of like if you went to a boxer size class and they thought you could like get into UFC. Um, like, you got to get out there. You got to get uh, make mistakes. Um, get beat up a lot. And I think the real world's your best uh, your best school. And, and it kind of sounds lame, like. You know, like the, the loser from high school is like, yeah, man, I learned in like the school of life, but it's kind of true in a lot of ways too. I, I don't think that, you know, a course or a program sets you up to deal with a lot of the stuff that Ku mentioned, like um, dealing with a boss who's very demanding. We're dealing with business stakeholders, um, dealing with fuzzy requirements, like the 95% of the things that are actually going to sink you are not the technical things. The technical things are table stakes. Like you, you need to learn this, but that's not going to make you, um, you know, a great data scientist, no more than, like I said, going to boxer size class on the weekends is going to set you up to, um, you know, get for the heavyweight title in UFC. So, but yeah, you could try it. I would, I would like to, mm -hmm. I would pay to watch that fight if you want to do it. So go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's also like, I think maybe the boxer size class might be a good introduction. If you do want to go to the UFC later, I think you, you have to do some of those things. Um, whether it's a program or some courses or whether you're just reading some of Dave's posts on SQL on LinkedIn as well. Like I think all of these are steps along the way to where, where you want to end up. And that yeah. might be the UFC, that might be wherever it is. You might be anywhere, but the thing is it's, it's so different than any other pursuit. It's about sets and reps, you know, putting in the hard work day in and day out. Like that's what makes you great at anything, right? Just, you know, getting a certificate or something once and it, it's it's cool you did that. Congrats. I mean, I definitely applaud people that put in the work, but like mm. you gotta put in the work every single day. Mm. Definitely. Okay. So myth number one, busted. You you don't become a data scientist <laughs> after a single program or a few courses. It takes time and effort and consistency. Okay. Yeah. Next myth. Go in pain. Mm, pain. <laughs> Lots of pain. Myth number two, yes. if you have data, you can do data science. Oh, I think Ben was asking me in the in the comments, am, am I going to say data or data? I really don't know. I my brain just kind of works in different ways. So I mm -hmm. we will see. Okay. Maybe we, we we can use how they pronounce to track the time zone they are in. Uh, so that <laughs> yeah. that could be a feature. <laughs> that could be a feature. Uh, so uh okay. Uh if you have data, you can do data science. So I'll start again then. <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, we, we, I had this discussion with a few with a few people uh, with a few friends, and and I think uh, one thing we want to, one thing I wanted to point out is that I think uh, a lot of companies uh, what they do is when they started off right when they started off they don't have any um, they don't have like I need to do data science. So what 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 they do is they collect data on the way or by the way kind. Um, so they don't pay too much attention to to the data. Um, so what happened is if they just started out and then you have a look at the data that they have, right? 
uh, calling it rubbish is an understatement. I'll put it that way. Uh, <laughs> that I, I'm pretty sure it's, 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 it's worse than that. Okay, it's worse than that. Um, so generally, like I said, um, if you have data, you can do data science. It's not really uh, correct in the sense that you also have to access how uh, good the data the data quality is before you can you can jump in into it. But um, having said that, it doesn't mean that you can't get value from that data. Uh, you can't get value from the data. You probably have to perhaps uh, adjust the, the the business questions that you can ask from the from the data. But with that in mind, probably the the question may not be of value then if that's the case. Uh, but at least you still can get some value out of it. Like uh, that's that's what I'm trying to say over here. Uh. Mm -hmm. So it's if what I'm hearing is sign is sort of like yes, you you might have data. But whether it's up to the right quality or the integrity or whether you can use it, you can actually use it for data science is, is, a, is a whole other question. Um, yeah. I think mm. for us, when we, when we work with the larger companies or the companies that have like very solid infrastructure, um, they do have the data that we can sometimes do the data science with. But for a lot of companies, they, as you were saying, Ku, like they, they might just get their data as it comes from, from a new line of business, from their reports every now and then. Um, and there's less strategy put around how to actually um, incorporate processes that help them improve that data set that they can work with. Um, well, I mean, Joe, it's kind of like if you decided, mm. yeah, I mean, if you just had like a giant pile of wood sitting in your front yard, I mean, what, what is that going to do you? I mean, it can either like light on fire or um, you could build something with it. But if you want to build something with it, you're going to have to have hopefully an architectural plan unless you're into just building things for the fun of it. Um, but a lot of it's similar to the argument of, you know, if you have data, you can do data science. Um, I mean, so one, one example um, that you see often is when a company will try and do uh, machine learning on um, data from like a data warehouse, right? Data warehouse data is, is very curated to the point where you've pretty much answered any question that's, that it's modeled for. And, you know, so in, in times when I would um, help companies do machine learning on, on BI data, nine times out of 10, uh, the, the answer is already in your data because it's like, why is this so accurate? It's just great. I'm like, yeah, it's because you're like the, the feature over here is like exactly your label over here. But cool. <laughs> <laughs> and Dave, what are what are your thoughts on this one? Uh, so I'm a big fan of this idea of necessary versus sufficient conditions. So having data is a necessary condition to do data science. If you don't have data, you can't do data science. It's even in the name. But just because you have data doesn't mean you can do data science. And that depends on also how you define data science. This is one of my pet peeves too. What do you mean? Is it machine learning? To Joe's point, maybe you don't really need to do machine learning on your Teradata data warehouse because it's already clean data. Uh, or is it more like a statistical analysis? I mean, it's just really complicated. So what I tend to tell people is like, look, data is the raw material, but it guarantees nothing nothing you just have to have the data and you have to give me some money as the data scientist to go do the pure research to see if there's any gold in them our hills doesn't mean i'm going to find it and that's when people get sad when you tell them stuff like that when you're like you got to give me money and you might not get anything for it and they're like what yeah well and the worst is, is uh, ben taylor what's up ben uh utah represent <laughs> um the promise of the uh, data lake became the data swamp like definitely for sure you got data. You got data swamps. I think on the opposite, and you got data puddles, um, and uh, you know and that's when you you think you have data, and there's like nothing really there. It's like nothing burger. So anyway, good question or good yeah. good myth. Yeah. 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 Very good myth, Ku. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so I, mean, I, I guess Singapore is the same as the rest of the world then. <laughs> I think that's one yeah. of the surprising things when we talk. Um, it's like it's like we're we're seeing all the same issues, but we're in totally different places around the world, and it's quite common um, for mm -hmm. these problems. It's just it seems like an industry wide issue. It doesn't matter where yeah. you are. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's funny because I, I, I travel the world, uh, you know, once in a while, and it's just funny because you also realize like just problems that, that you see, just data or, or whatever, like everyone in the world is dealing with like the same stuff usually, you know. Uh, drama, great things and happiness and everything in between. And there's just, and I think that the common denominator is just people at the end of the day, you know, so. Mm -hmm. 
Definitely. Okay, so yeah. are we are we happy with myth number two? Busted. You, totally yep. busted. Yeah, busted. totally busted. Yep, yep. Totally we're, busted. we're good. Two from two at the moment. All right. So, <laughs> the, for <laughs> for the next one, I think I've I've actually got the the all the different myths in order from people. So if we do another one from Ku, um, I might actually choose one which is actually no, it's quite related as well. So we'll stick with Ku's one. Myth number three: If it is not complicated mathematics, it is not data science. Thoughts. I think this one goes back to what uh, Dave have mentioned just now, and that is um, hopefully, uh, what's the definition of data science in the first place? What, 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 what's, the def what's the definition? So if we were to go with the definition that I had just now, which is deriving value from uh, data, well, I mean, a simple moving average or a simple average can tell a lot of stories, right? I mean, um, so average could tell a story. Average together can, uh, together with median can tell even a bigger story. The average plus medium plus the skillness, kurtosis, and all this can tell even more stories. So why why it needs to be complicated? Then then it needs to be then it has to be data science. I think it's more of like a, a lot of people see data science as machine learning, or they put they put data science equals to machine learning. Uh, and then the thing is the the funny part is this. They put data science equals to machine learning and actually linear regression or linear regression, let's go with linear regression, is actually part of machine learning as well, if, if you look at it, or at least based on what I see. And linear regression is actually very simple mathematics. I mean, if you don't go down to the gradient descent or how to, how to derive the parameters and all this. But it's, it's, it's also not that complicated at, as well. Uh, so are we saying, then are we saying linear regression is not complicated and so it's not data science or whatever. So so the question, the, the thing is, my my at the end of the day, what I feel is if you can get the mathematics to be as simple as possible, I think that would be the best because then it's easier to explain to the stakeholders as well. Uh, the only problem is the stakeholders will say, huh, it's not that complicated. Uh. Is it really data science? <laughs> That's why you have to spend like one full hour just to go and try to explain to them again <laughs> what's, what's happening around them. <laughs> That's when Ku hands them an invoice and they're like, that's ah, all wrong I get for the well, invoice, Ku? What's going on here, man? Is there an extra zero at the end it's, of that? It's an interesting question, though. Uh, yeah. the, the word complicated, I think, is relative, though, right? So, I mean, there are some companies where complicated is um, might be easy, actually. Um, like one of my clients, they deal, uh, do a lot of like AI drug discovery and like the mathematics they're doing there is... Uh, it's complicated for a very good reason because they're dealing with a very complicated subject. But if you go to most businesses, I would say complicated is very relative, especially I think to hit on Dave's uh, points of uh, teaching data literacy, right? So what's simple to you or what's complicated to you is very relative um, against maybe the broader organization. And so by leveling up, um, you know, the, uh, the competency and the, the, um, you know, related to data, perhaps things won't be as complicated and, and then you'll just need to do things more complicated in order to justify data science. I don't know. So, but it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an, a, it's a goal to which um, you may or may not ever arrive. So. Yeah. I think, I think Joe's hitting a really good point, right? Is that complexity is a spectrum. So I used to work at a small little company called Microsoft and it's a big company and they have different types of organizations in different types of businesses, right? So like, for example, if you work in SQL Server and you're doing engine optimizations for the, for the, the, the SQL Server database engine, it's extremely complicated. And, or if you're in Azure or if you're in Bing or wherever, the nature of those problems, the complexity is gonna be different than if you work in the marketing department, for example. So I think we have to keep that in mind. However, that being said, I would bet $1,000 US that if you add up all the analytics that's done in every company all around the world every day, the vast majority of it is not complicated. It's on the far left end of the spectrum. Mm, definitely. It's like the the low hanging fruit or the quick wins is yeah. the, the things that get the most airplay. Um, but yet there's, there's so much like almost like a uh, hype and love for the things which are really complex. Like if you're not doing deep learning, you're not, you're not doing data science, for example. But that's a future myth that we'll, we'll cover later. But I well, think. And, 
The litmus test I like to use for, for interviewing data scientists is, um, you know, tell me how you'd solve this problem. And, and the litmus test really is, is a person going to start with first asking about the problem and diving into it, and then maybe starting with simpler methods and working up, or they just jump, jump like straight to like, you know, let's, let's attack it with like deep learning and a nuclear bomb and just be done. Um, so, cause yeah, it's like, you, you could do that, but then it also shows like, well, maybe, you know, maybe you're more interested in just applying these techniques. You just, you're really excited about, and, and again, nothing wrong with that, but there's a time and place for everything. So, mm. um, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of goes off the rails and, and especially when you get a team of, of hyper smart data scientists who don't have direction. Um, like the amount of complication you see just goes to the roof. It's, it's, it's pretty wild. So mm -hmm. I think to cover off this myth as well, there's, I, I'm probably going to butcher this quote really badly, but there's, I think there's an Einstein one where it's like, if you, if you can't explain it simply enough, you just don't understand it well enough or something like that. Um, something about <laughs> that, complex. Yeah, that's fine. That I think sounds it very Einstein. Yeah, that yeah. Sounds it, very yeah it should be uh, like something like it should be, uh, simple but no simpler or something like that yeah something yeah. like that like okay. it's it's about the right level of complexity so if you can if you're working on something really complicated with the mathematics in the data science space um you should be able to explain it to a layman to mm -hmm. actually like explain okay here's why we're using it and here's the benefits it has over something else um, I think we we just don't focus much on that in the industry like we we kind of just jump straight into oh, we use this tool why do you use it uh, because everyone else is, and that's that's where the conversation usually ends, or whatever, something like that. So a really good person to look at is uh, Richard Feynman, the uh, the physicist. When he, when if you look at his lectures, they're actually uh, very simple in the way he explains in incredibly complicated topics. Like that to me is a model of how if you can master a subject to the point where you can explain it that simply, then you've mastered the subject. Mm. Typically, what you see is when people overcomplicate things and like to show off how smart they are. Um, they're at the level of mastery is actually quite low. Um, it's, there's more of a Dunning Kruger at play, right? So, um, so. Mm. yeah, yeah Dunning Kruger Joe is on a, Joe touched on a very good point here. I think for, for, for the audiences, right? If you know, like whether you have mastered a certain, uh, subject areas or something like that, right? I think more importantly is you, tr you should try to then find someone to explain to and see how the person actually reacts to it, whether he or she actually understands what's your, what, what, what you're talking about. I mean, if he or she understands what you're talking about and all this, then I think you sort of have succeeded in that particular subject area and then you can then move on to the to the other areas. Uh, yeah, with, I think also, I, I think Alan, Alan is in, in, in the comment section say, explain, explain like I'm five, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah you you can welcome. Explain yes. like I'm five. Yeah. yeah, we should do uh, that for, for another session, another idea, data heretics. <laughs> explain like I'm five. Okay. Okay, that cool. might be actually the hardest one. <laughs> so. I, I think it will be the most fun as well. All right. Yeah, so myth number three, definitely busted. Oh, busted yeah. for sure. Okay. So the, the next suite of myths are, are Dave's myths. Um, oh. you'll, you'll see the flavor of them. So we'll start with <laughs> the first one. Okay. Myth number one from Dave, you can't use R in production. Only Python is allowed. Exclamation mark. Busted. Um, Busted. <laughs> Did, we can move on. Okay, next one. Next question. Yeah. So this is one I get a lot. I get people asking me this question on LinkedIn all the time. It's like, well, can I use R for this? Can I use R for that? And the answer is yes, you can. With the caveat, as with everything, right tool for the job. So for example, <laughs> Python's not perfect for everything either. There's a reason why people still code in C and C++, for example. There's reasons for that. So if you use the right tool for the job, you can totally do it. For example, in my last job, I, bu I built a bunch of R code in and put it in production. And it had robust logging, and it did all everything that you would expect of any programming language. The question was, was it the right tool for the job? And in this case, it was. It wasn't a large volume of data. They were batch processes, that sort of thing. But they were well-crafted, well-engineered pieces of software, just like anything else. If I had used an object-oriented programming language, it wouldn't make a difference. So. The real question is, do you know enough about the backing computer science to actually pick the right tool for the job? It's R and Python is, is not the real question. Do you know enough to pick the right tool? That's the real question. Mm. Mm. Great. Definitely. Joe, do you, do you want to weigh in on this one in terms of like some of the technology that we use in production? It's, it's totally almost like independent of whether you use R or Python. You can 
you can literally put anything in a Docker container and deploy it wherever you need. So I think having yeah, the debate. I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it's kind of a, it, it's a silly debate in a lot of ways. Uh, in, in one sense, it, it, the debate is constrained between two, um, in my opinion, false options as well. Maybe the answer is neither. Um, maybe the answer really? is um, that's her. That's heretical. Use... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know. Py I mean, trust me. I, I started a Python meetup seven years ago, and it's still going strong. I, I, I know Python really well, and I know its limitations really well. Um, so, you, you know, I, I would say, in in a lot of cases, maybe yeah, it could be none of the above. Maybe Go is a really good language for what you need to do. I don't know. I mean, what kind of what are you trying to do and, and what's the outcome and, and what's the cheapest, quickest way to get it done that's not going to incur a lot of technical debt? That's how I frame it. The R versus mm -hmm. Python argument, I think, is kind of silly. Like, I, I like R a lot, but I, I view it more from my, my personal workflow. It's more of a hand calculator just because I can tie up, you know, turn it on and just do things and it does things. Uh, Python's a great general purpose language, but even Python E says to be the first to admit that it's a Python is the second best language at everything. So it's kind of like a cross fitter, actually. Like it's it's not great at any any particular sport, um, but it, it does good enough. But if you it, but again, if your if your problem is very specific, I mean, there's great languages. Rust is another one that's coming up. I mean, that solves a lot of problems, um, depending on your problem. So that's my opinion on that. Hmm. Yeah, I think. More importantly, is being able to solve the problem with the with the best tool. Uh, I think that that's that's the most important. And, and if I were to put approach this from sort of maybe a career perspective, I so so generally doing doing classes, right? What will happen is people ask me, so which one should I learn? Should I learn R or should I learn Python? I frame it the other way around. I say is that hey, let me ask you this question first. If you if you only know one tool, right? You know that you only have access to this amount of jobs. But if you know two tools, right? Naturally speaking, you, you should be able to access more more jobs. If that's the case, you should be able to apply to more jobs. And if you pick up SQL, I'm pretty sure you can hit about ninety one percent of the of the job vacancies and all this. So at the end of the day, I I kind of feel the the discussion about R versus Python and all this is a bit of a clickbait, uh, like what we discussed uh, pre pre this uh, session and all this. I think more importantly, if you're if you're really serious about uh, data science as a career and all this, right? Pick up as many tools as possible. I know people will start saying and say that, oh, okay, well, pick up how many tools, but how how do we know how proficient we are? Um, one just one statement will do, and that is how good you can uh, use a tool in your project. Uh, as if you're that good, if you you if the during the project, right, you're able to use the tool to solve the problem, then you you're considered proficient by that project. Yeah, by the project. Yeah. Mm, definitely. Mm. Okay, mm. myth definitely busted. So you can you can use whatever you want in production. Okay, as long as it's the right thing. As long as it's as long right. as it's the right thing. Okay. Yes. Well, and our 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 rules too. So. Our mm. rules, yes. Our rules, <laughs> definitely, definitely. All right, let's let's move on to the next one. It's another Dave Langer myth as well. So data scientists should be able to write production quality code. Yeah, so this one's inspired by, I'm sure we've all seen it, right? This this Venn diagram from way back in the day where there's like business knowledge, mathematics, and computer science, and then the intersection is this mythical unicorn data scientist that can do it all, right? So generally speaking, if you're a data scientist, if you can do analytics and you can also write production quality code, that's awesome. That's great. That's that's beautiful. However, I don't think, generally speaking, these days we should say that that is the de facto standard. We have data engineers, um, we have machine learning engineers now that are coming to the fore. So this idea of like, what exactly is a data scientist anymore? If you have these other roles, especially in a large organization, I would argue that first and foremost, a data scientist should be doing analytics. And if that means they're writing, God forbid, an R script and it's not production quality because they just needed to do it to do an analysis to produce a business result or a business insight, great. That's all they should be able, that's all they should need to do. Production quality code should be a stretch goal at, at best, or generally speaking, it's not even on the table anymore. And that's how I kind of look at it these days. That being said, as I just mentioned earlier, I do write production code because I used to be a software engineer, but I wouldn't say that should be the de facto standard. I think the the production quality is another thing as well. Like people have different 
standards that they call production. So it really depends <laughs> yeah. on like, yeah, pr production code. So I think it's 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 always good to aim to write really good code at all times as best to your ability as you can. Um, always try and improve your coding skills um, when you're learning on your journey. But I think it's when, when we're working um, in the industry, sometimes you just don't have time to write perfect code. You, you just need to get something out the door really quickly. Um, and you just have to be pragmatic and just do whatever you can to get the right thing out. And I, I totally agree with Dave in terms of, like I think as data scientists in the current age, like we, we really need to be good with the data and actually be great analysts because we're, we're going to be digging around to try and find just exactly what the thing we should be doing the science on is. And I, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of focus on the computing side and the machine learning side and everything, but not so much on, on the value of what we're doing and how quickly we can get to the value. But yeah, that's, that's my yeah. thoughts on, on this one. Well, yeah, I, th I think it used to be the case that, that, that Drew Conway's uh, Venn diagram was maybe the best archetype of what a data scientist was back in like 2010. Um, but I mean, everything's changed. Uh, so uh, I actually, my, my prediction is that the, the role of data scientist is actually going to go away at a certain point. Because the term, I, I sometimes go through days where I'm like, data science is neither. I'll let you think about that for a second. Um, <laughs> so, um, because if, if you're trying to stuff all these different roles into uh, a position, um, I mean, th think about what that means. Think about other roles where you're trying to um, stuff all these different skill sets and expectations into um, a single role and expecting great, great results, right? Um, as a manager, I would say it's unconscionable, actually. Uh, I, could, I could see on a, on a small team, uh, you know, making these requirements that, yeah, you have to be able to put things in production. But again, as, as you know, Danny pointed out, what, what's, what's production? Um, you know, and I, I expect what's going to happen is as data, as companies become more data native and more data centric in general, software engineers are going to be working on the production aspect. The data scientists, I think, it, what are, or whatever the future term of that is, should be focused more on um, domain expertise and how it applies to data and getting results out of it. Notice I didn't say machine learning or anything related to that. I think those are like total red herrings. Now, back in the day when data science was first, um, you know, part of the lexicon, and we'll touch on this in a bit as well, but, you know, it was, it was a different thing. Like that was, it, it was kind of the, the implication of it was that it was related to uh, machine learning. I mean, that's at least in my world, but that was also when, machine learning was sort of getting becoming the, the cool thing. But now it's like, it, why does it have to be that way? Yeah, I think mm -hmm. I, I've, I've posted on this on LinkedIn and um, I'm wondering if the future of data scientists is actually a really technical business analyst role. Because there was this original, def not original, it was like an old school definition of a data scientist. And I'm fond of this one and I use it a lot on LinkedIn, which is, a data scientist knows more about computer science than any statistician and more about statistics than any computer scientist. Machine learning isn't in there anywhere. The idea being essentially is like, you can write code and you know data. You're not necessarily an expert statistician, you're not necessarily an expert computer scientist, but you know enough of both to add a synergistic value proposition. How's that for consulting speak? <laughs> well, the term originated in 1974, believe it or not. I think it's the first usage of it. So. And it's been around for a bit, yeah. but you know, right now it's sort of like it's it, it, right now it just kind of encompasses any job. I'm pretty sure, like moving boxes and being able to lift 50 pounds is also a requirement um, for some data science application you know, jobs as well. So um, just wait; it'll mm -hmm. encompass everything. He'll be making your fries. It'll, it'll be all kinds of other things. So. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see. I see the job description <laughs> now, Joe. Senior fulfillment data scientist. Come work in art. <laughs> Must be able to put boxes in production. So, yeah, it's crazy. Okay, but I I just want to share. But I I also want to be transparent. I haven't I haven't I have not written a production quality code before. I I written a lot of codes, yes, but I haven't written a production quality code because, uh, I I was quite fortunate. I was uh when I was working in the banks, we we had a team of people to to uh manage all this. So at the end of the day, uh, it allows uh I think the rest of us to 
play to our strength. So and and my strength is actually on the on the analytical skills and also the the ML skills and 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 all this. Uh, but having said that, I think even though data scientists sh should be able to, I'll, I'll just say that I think it would be good for data scientists to know how to write a production quality code, but not necessarily have to write a production quality code. I think, mm, yeah. because at the end of the day, I kind of feel that uh, data science, right, is a team sport. It's a team sport and everything. So if we are able to work together well, which means a lot of communication, a lot of uh, empathy involved and all this, I think that would be uh, generally very, very helpful. Uh, that, that's, that's I my think take on this note, you're, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're, I think you are correct in the sense where uh, there, there needs to be standards for teams. Like you just can't have everybody mm -hmm. going off and writing whatever the hell they want to write. That That's a recipe for just insanity. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to have standards. I mean, even even on my teams, I would have code reviews and there, there were coding standards actually written in a wiki. It's like code needs to look like this. Mm -hmm. If you're writing Python, you need to abide by PEP8. Um, to the point where things not 79 characters are going to get rejected because at some point if you if you're if you're loose on that then what else are you going to be loose on right yeah. so yeah but. It, the one thing i the one thing i would be worried about though on that is mm -hmm. software engineering is a huge huge area of study oh yes it's a huge yes. area of study yes. um you expect somebody that it's like okay look you need to know all the stat, you know, all the statistics. You need to know all of the machine learning algorithms. You need to know all this stuff. Oh, and by the way, you need to know object orientation all the way. Oh, here's 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 the gang of four. Go read it. Learn all the design patterns. Learn all the stuff. It, it just it's so much. So just yes, like it, I think this is why I think this is why you see in large organizations, you know, the breaking out of roles: data engineer, machine learning engineer, data scientist. It's it's what you had in IT for a long time, right? You had different types of software engineers that specialize in different things. You might have a DBA that's really, really good at the database and the software engineer is okay at writing queries because it's just too much stuff for any one person to know, right? Which is why I think that Venn diagram, that's why we call it the unicorn now, right? That person in the center because it doesn't exist, it's mm -hmm. mythical. Uh, yeah. You're, you're, you're right. I, I actually tried my hands on like, so I have like two books in my office now on, on software engineering and all this. I, let's put it this way. I haven't even started looking at it. Right? <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. There's so much, there's so much to learn, but, but that is also, I, I will say one of the, one of the things that I enjoyed doing uh, data science work and all this is to read up, be able to read up all the different things and how they uh, gel and mesh up, gel and mesh up together. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Awesome. Did we so bust this myth? myth? Yeah, this myth is totally, totally busted. Definitely gone. Um, well, I guess we could we could rip off the show and say plausible. Mm. Very. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I, I say busted though. I vote busted. Mm. I think it's pretty busted. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> So we're okay. gonna. I'm gonna have a change of pace, and we're gonna go with one of Joe's myths um, before we jump back into Dave's programming ones as well. Sure. But I think this one is really good. Um, so Joe's myth is people skills aren't important for data scientists. Let's go. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I think all too often I, I see and it, it's data scientists and uh, people in technical roles in general. Um, feel like the, by being a great technician that somehow absolves them from uh, being able to communicate or relate with people. Uh, so this ends up causing, um, I would say lots of problems for that person uh, in their career. I, I, in fact, as I tell people, people ask me for career advice and I, and I tell them basically, look, your technical skills are sort of a given, in my opinion. Like, um, you're going to constantly refine those because that's how technology works. If you aren't sharpening your technology skills, you'll be out of a job soon. Um, that's table stakes. That's like that's like saying like you know you're um, if you're an athlete, like you you know you have certain physical capabilities. Like that that's a given. But apart from that, it's like you know being able to relate with people is um, the thing that's really going to set you apart in your career. It's what's going to set you apart from being an individual contributor, for example, versus maybe someday you might want to be a manager or an executive, or you might just have to talk to managers, directors, executives, and so forth, right? And so this is where people skills 
um, you know, learning how to communicate with people, um, uh, you know, negotiation, um, being nice to people, like having empathy, these sorts of things. <laughs> it's like, you, these are what's going to get you ahead in your career, surprisingly enough. Um, and an organizations tend to function better when people have, I would say, a higher level of people skills across the board. So the opposite sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> right. If you had like a bunch of incredibly smart people who had no people skills, like that, that to me is like exactly where I would probably like run away from. So, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, oh, you go, Ku, you, you go first. Oh, okay. Uh, um, actually, I did. I, I wrote a blog post on this uh, about the people skills. So, so generally, so what, what, I, what I call that blog post, I call it from, from good to great. So, Good data scientists are those people who has that three, I mean, the, that, that Venn diagram that we were talking about in the previous myth. Um, so you have, but my, my Venn diagram is a bit different from 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 uh, from, the, from the common one. Um, so, but coming back, I think if you want to move from good data scientists to become a great data scientist, you can't run away from people's skills. You have to, especially I think given now that we are in a team, uh, team spot and all this, right? When we do data science and everything, it's all about team and all this. That's where communication uh, comes into the picture, uh, and we have to communicate a lot, of a, a lot, a lot. And I, I think slowly, slowly, you start to realize if if you are really in the in the data science world, you start to realize that actually communicating with computers or with programming and codes, yes, it has its frustration and all this, but it's definitely much better than communicating with with the stakeholders and the and the, and the humans uh, involved as well. But I would say. It comes with practice, so go out there and make mistakes. But you, when you make mistakes, make sure it's not the important people, or the influential people, <laughs> uh, but more of like maybe people who who can tolerate your mistakes or who can even guide you on 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 uh, uh, working on those mistakes to to remove them in the future. I think that 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 would be fantastic. Uh, so it's something that you can't avoid. You have to have the people skill if you want to perform uh, well in the in the job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Dave, your your thoughts on people skills? Oh, I, I was laughing when Joe said nice because I will admit that's not necessarily always my strong suit. I'm still working on that. Mine neither. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but absolutely, people skills are super important, and I agree with Ku 100. I used to have this saying that um, I used to I used to utter every now and then where I would say, "I never met a computer I didn't like, but I've met lots of people I can't stand." <laughs> Which kind of kind of typifies my behavior maybe 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> but yes, absolutely correct. You you have to have people skills. You have to be a communicator, especially if you buy this hypothesis that the hardcore data scientists slide the pizza under the door while they're coding in the middle of the night kind of thing isn't the way that, that job's going. It's going to be more of a technical business analyst role. Communication and people skills are going to be more and more important. Uh, something I work on myself, I will freely admit that it's not my strong suit and something I'm trying to constantly work on. It's extremely important, extremely important. Yeah, Emmanuel think, actually has a good point here. Uh, best soft skill is, is to listen. I, I totally agree. And maybe, maybe some advice on this too. Like when you're, when you're dealing, people feel, a lot, of, a lot of problems in the workplace happen when people don't feel like they're being heard. And so, so one, one thing you can do when, when you're sort of at an impasse with somebody or if you feel like you're repeating yourself is just say, well, um, or if you feel like somebody's repeating themselves to you, again, just, just ask, well, so if I'm hearing you correctly, and just repeat back what they said. Repeating back what people say is like the most beautiful thing that they hear because now they feel like they're being heard. And, and normally that, that actually quashes a lot of things. Um, some, some really good books I would suggest reading is How to Win Friends and Influence People. There's a timeless classic in this area. Uh, you should read that and read it often actually. Um, I seem to always pick up something new uh, when I read that. Um, Never Split the Difference is another great book. It was written by an FBI hostage negotiator. Uh, um, negotiator. And that book is um, single-handedly one of my favorite books um, in general. I think I've read it like three times now. Uh, it's, and this, this teaches you the arts of dealing with people in very stressful situations. I mean, if you can imagine being a hostage negotiator, um, so, so maybe some things are like, most people think win-win is a great idea, right? Well, okay, in a hostage negotiation, how are you gonna do win-win? Am I gonna give you like half a hostage and then you know you get the other one? Like, it doesn't really work that way. 
So you need to figure out, um, you know, how, how people think and how, um, and there's a certain operating system to most human beings. Figure that out. I, I think you're going to go pretty far if you can figure these things out. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I have many many stories of where my my people skills have limited me in different projects or different environments or different things like that, um, and I've I've seen in the comments here where people are wishing that they didn't have to have this experience firsthand, but I think that for the people who are more aware and now they they focus more on the people skills, it's usually because they realize that they have a lack of it, um, and I think yeah, I think all of us can yep. put our well. Ku is pretty cool though. Cool, cool. Ku is really yeah. nice. Guy. I think for, I mean, for, if you're for us, embarrassed for the person you were ten years ago, like you should try harder at <laughs> mm. uh, getting a bad reputation for yourself or something. I don't know. So, mm. like, <laughs> like, there's all these different things. Like uh, a bad reputation is better than no reputation, or different things. Like that, which, <laughs> like, so. I'm taking that one. I'm taking that one, Danny. I need that one. <laughs> like, <laughs> But I to me, like the, the people skill side, um, the thing that I've really tried to focus on probably in the last like six to 12 months was trying to um, just try and view things from other people's perspective a bit better. For me, I'm, I'm very closed in on my mind. And if I have a vision of something, I'm going to try and like, I'll run through walls to get to wherever I need to go without thinking of other people's views and how they might feel or how they might look politically or whatever it is. And that's caused me many issues throughout my career. And I, after having gone through those experiences and identifying um, quite brutally um, the mistakes that I've made and vowing to try and not do those mistakes again, um, I think that has really helped me in terms of just, just handling the interpersonal relationship side of what we do for work. Like more often than not, it's 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 not about the the quality of your work or how how quickly you can deliver something. It's more around the people that you're delivering it for, um, or your your coworkers. If you do something that's I don't know, let's say puts them in a bad light, have you kind of addressed that in some way and and tried to minimize that collateral damage by trying to help them out or doing all these sorts of things which people don't really think about in general especially within the technical field like there's there's such a bona fide image of oh the the best data scientist or data engineer or whatever it is they just sit in the dark in the terminal not talking to anyone just smashing out their own code um and that's that's the vision of like the best but there's I mean no look at what happened with Linus Torvald lately you know I mean, you know, the inventor of Linux, uh, look what happened to mm -hmm. Linus Torvald uh, recently, like Linus, he, he was basically like uh, ostracized and told to go to um, like, to go check up on his people skills. And he's kind of removed himself from a lot of day-to-day um, -day work now. And he's one of the best engineers on the planet, period. And he's still, mm -hmm. you know, there's a certain point where it's just, you know, people, you, you succeed around people to the extent that you can make them feel good. Mm. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. So that can be rough sometimes when you're in the data biz, though. It can be, right? And that's why I think you got to have the balance. You got to stand for something too, and you got to know what you stand for, like who you are, because because there's there's definitely a fine line between like being a pushover, in which case like you're not going to get very far in your career. Um, you got to know what you mm -hmm. stand for at a certain point, and be willing to back it up. And sometimes you're not going to be popular, <laughs> so that that is a balance for sure. I yeah uh, to that I, I kind of feel that I think uh probably at the start of your career you don't step on too many toes but I think more importantly is to build uh, what I'll call the political capital in the in the organization first and how you build that political capital will be by showing results um same, so so yesterday I was discussing this with with uh in another channel and what what I shared was that I kind of feel that I think at the end of the day. Uh, as long as you keep on providing value to your employer, to your organization, uh, that is how you earn your salary. That's one. Uh, second thing is that that is how you earn your political capital with your different stakeholders. So the more the more political capital you 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 save up, um, you you they will listen more to you as well. They are more open to listen uh, to you. So at the end of the day, 
once you have accumulated so much political capital, you have a very good reputation. The, the most important thing is to keep that reputation at that particular level and don't be an a-hole <laughs> about this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Mm. Yeah, I think being able to understand the lay of the land and the different relationships that different people have and their standing in wherever organization you come into, especially as a new person, is super important because who knows, you, you might just unknowingly say the wrong thing and put someone important offside and then that's that that will limit you and that's the bottom line so yes. yeah i think yeah definitely this myth is totally busted anyone oh, yeah. anyone who disagrees with us drop a comment and we'll <laughs> reply to it and we'll bust it again so um but yeah this this myth is totally gone let's let's how are we going for time we've gone through 50 50 minutes awesome it feels like we've just started talking to be honest yeah it this is. is really fun I mean, what, what's it what's the time limit um there is unlimited time so it's until <laughs> until you guys are happy so, all right well, let's it's go morning with, let's, for you guys though <laughs> yeah 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 it's let's morning for, but i think especially danny because that, that's like now going through his lunch time <laughs> oh it's okay i i had breakfast uh, so it's all good okay I said so yeah. there's a few uh, R versus Python myths as well as a tooling myth. So I'm just going to try and bundle all these myths together. So let's mm -hmm. let's just quickly do that. So firstly, this one is from Dave. So Python is better than R for machine learning. Um, there's a follow-on myth from that one, which is Python is easy to learn. There's another one, which is R is hard to learn. And there's a follow-up from uh, from Joe as well, which is data science is all about tools. So I wish I could put all we're of talking, them. We're talking technical tools, not people. So mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we can go that way if you want. Yeah. I don't really care. But <laughs> I think it's covered in the last one. Like, sometimes it's hard to tell. So. <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. uh maybe uh let, let, let me start first uh before it, it slips my mind and all this so, so maybe, uh, i think first thing first let, let, let me share with with the rest uh my my programming journey um so i actually i started off my first language is is, is java uh and i i suck at it i i made it here on video i made it here on linkedin as well i'm, I'm okay with that <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good with Java. What what about all the public and private thing? I can't I have I, I I can never figure that out and all this. <laughs> I'm really that bad. And protected too, Ku. Protected as well. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um I took Java I took Java during my undergrad days. Uh I, I was really bad at it. I got a I got a C grade out of it. Uh really was wasn't very good. Um so I told myself actually, I, I actually did really tell myself. I said that hey, I I don't want to touch programming ever again. I mean, yes, I tried my I tried my hands on <laughs> programming and all this. So long story short, yeah, I have to go back to programming since I'm doing I'm dealing with data and so sort of the next. Uh, I call it language, right? But there are people who say no, that's not a language. And uh, actually, the next of the next language I touched on was uh, SAS, the uh, the software company. Uh, quite I think they are quite big in Australia and US as well. Um. And I tried picking it up again because I was I, I came out during a recession period. Uh, I graduated during a recession period, um, so I picked up SAS uh, language. Uh, now it wasn't it wasn't too bad, no, it wasn't too bad. Uh, it was quite easy to use. I think given the fact that it was so limited to a certain context, that and that is handling data and all this, so that's why it's, it was easier. The syntax was easier to pick up as well, and also through through that I picked up my SQL. And I was so amazed by SQL because it was like the language is so close to English. I, I can't find another language that's so close to English. Uh, so I, I was talking to Joe in, in, in his uh, video and all this. I was so amazed by it. I think everyone should pick up. Really everyone, even business stakeholders, they should pick up. It's, it's, it's not yeah. too difficult. Yeah. Uh, SQL, then after that, I went to pick up R. And, and when I pick up R, this is my, this is what, this is the impression I have when I pick up R. It's similar to Excel. Why is that so? Most of them are actually you call out functions and then you have parameters uh, passed in and all this. It's it's very similar to Excel because Excel, that's what they do also. You have a function name, open bracket, then you have all the parameters passed in. It's just that I think for for Excel, it's fixed. It's a sort of a positional, positional parameters, whereas 
if you're looking at R and all this, it's not really, it's just, it's, you can actually pass in keyword parameters or, or positional parameters and, and, and so on. So I was quite amazed by it. I, I, I love R. Uh, I, I love R. And of course, I mean, I don't want to limit myself in terms of career, <laughs> in terms of career. And I went to pick up Python as well. And actually, long story short, I, I, I think one of the myths that was saying that Python is good for ML versus R. I don't know. I mean, if you just look at the, the line of codes that you have to write for ML, right, between R and uh, Python, I'm not too sure. I kind of still prefer R, though. I mean, the, the, the amount of codes need, needed is very little compared to Python. I still can't wrap around the fact that why why in Python, when I use the scikit-learn, right, I have to split into four data sets, the, the, X, the X train, X test, and the Y train, Y, y test. Why can't they just be a single data frame and pass it in and then break it up and then that's that's about it already. But before I go on, I probably will have start people start start, start to scold me about Python and all this. So yeah, but that's that's my own opinion. Okay, I say first. <laughs> that's my own opinion. So but long story short, I kind of like so my, my general preference is actually uh R. Uh, and I and I like that tidy R uh universe where you have all the like deployer, uh the the deployer, especially deployer. I I love deployer. It's, it's very cool. It's very good. Yeah. So I don't think it's hard to learn. Uh, especially, I think uh, in, in another video, I was chatting with Joe, we were saying that in order to learn programming these days, right, I mean, uh, maybe don't don't quite learn, quite pick up programming these days, right? You just only need that two skills I was talking about previously, and that was Google and copy and paste. And mm -hmm. Dave, if you want to say something about that, the, the <laughs> Uh, the stack overflow. <laughs> yeah, stack? so it's really not that. Stack overflow. Yes, stack overflow. <laughs> stack overflow. Yeah. Yes. It's the key to learning how to code. Stack overflow, baby. Two words. Yep. Yep. Mm. Uh, 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 uh. Two words. Yeah. Yes. Well. But I think to to cover off the the data science is all about the tools. Like we 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 talk a lot about the different languages and the different frameworks and whatever things that we're using. But at, I think at the end of the day, um, data science is about getting the value out of the data. And like, no matter which way you want to do it, the faster, the better, and the more robust, the better. And um, when we think of all the different languages and learning them and all those sorts of things like the, like this, this, I think the myth of Python is easy to learn is an interesting one as well. There's like, there's the meme where it's like someone learns Python in like in 12 hours of, of like overnight or something. And then they think that they know Python really well. Um, I think that that's like a misnomer where, yes, you can learn how to write very basic programs after just jumping into a very simple course, um, but whether you can use it directly within your projects to make effective value out of whatever your, your data is, that's something else. Um, and in the same way, when, when we think of R as hard to learn, um, I think we, before we jumped on live, we were talking about like the, the way that we, we had to learn when we were starting all these languages. Like I think the first time I used R, there wasn't dplyr or any of those packages. Everything was in base R. And mm. um, like I think Dave or Joe was saying, oh, you you guys have it easy when when you're <laughs> learning new stuff now. Like all of all of all of these materials and like Joe was sharing us a book that he was reading. Um, you, yeah. Back in and, the day. Yeah. I mean this is like you know, uh, machine learning. And I found about Ravid uh, Jain, I think is his name. Uh, Mike Denny is talking about uh, how this is being released and packed. Um, but, you know, back in the day, like the machine learning, especially, you, you had to either learn from books or like esoteric white papers. And like, I think there was that. And there was what else? Peter Norvig's uh, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence book. It's like the other staple back in the day. But like, and I think everything was like in Weka. Um, at least I was getting into things. So it's like oh, Python wasn't yeah. even like a language back then. You know what I'm saying? Like right. it, they well, call it, it wasn't, wasn't used for like data science. It was data they mining. They called it yeah. data mining, so, right? Like a data mining. You know, yeah. and you get into discussions with people and it was like, oh yeah, well like, you know, support vector machines are like where it's at. Like that neural networks, that was, because back back then it was like artificial intelligence wasn't even, I mean, it was actually a bad word to use because there had been um, some failures before. And, um, like, so when I was working at a startup, we're doing uh, automated ML, this is back in the early 2010s, but like, like there's no way we're going to use the term artificial intelligence to describe what we do, because that make you make me very unpopular. Actually, it was uh, predictive, um, 
yeah, like predictive models or predictive something or other. But it, yeah, definitely AI was not 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 the cool thing to say. And then deep learning came on the scene and they completely shut that down. So I think the, the point of that is it's like the, the tools are the tools, and I, I would say it, it's it's sort of a the difficulty versus easy to learn stuff too. It's like look, everyone starts somewhere. I mean, tools that were hard to learn back then, people still picked them up. I mean, for God's sake, Dave was doing COBOL and mainframes back in like the 1800s or something. Like, so, um, <laughs> like or whenever, whenever they were using those things. Dude, so, how old do you think I am, man? <laughs> you just said COBOL and mainframes. And like, that truly, it must have been back then. Um, but you know, no, seriously, you know, you learn what you got to learn. It's not like, you know, it, here's the thing it's going to get a lot easier to do machine learning going forward because there's a lot of auto ML too. So, I mean, take your pick and you want to just like do that instead. Cause I, honestly, that's pretty cool and works a lot of times, you know, data robots doing some cool stuff. Uh, all the clouds have their tools and, and that's just it. I, you know, anymore, I'm kind of the opinion, like if, if you're going to pick up a tool, make sure that you're using it on like a, a, a use case that's um, core to your business. Right. Because a lot of this stuff can be automated, frankly, but if it's an algorithm that, that is very core, like TikTok, for example, like that's an algorithm. That's all that company is. You can call it a video service if you want, but really it's an AI company, like plain and simple. And that's literally the value of the company is the algorithm. Like that's not something you're going to do with AutoML. Like you'd be, TikTok would like kind of suck actually if it did it that way. But um, but that, all the attention's on that, right? I mean, it's, it's like I always tell people, like, you know, uh, people who want to write their own whatever from scratch. I'm like, are you, like, when, when you go uh, get your tires changed, do you, do you go like, make them from scratch like you know from like raw materials uh probably not i mean you probably go to a tire store and you buy tires like a normal person right and, and tools are the same way um like focus your, your attention on things where you're going to get the most value your time is very limited and budget's limited so don't think you can spend your time doing this that or the other thing like like i, I would say just try and automate everything that's not core or use managed services um and in that case, it's all about just outsourcing tools. So data science is all about outsourcing the tools that don't matter as maybe how I would uh, answer that question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I 100% agree, which is why these days I focus so much on just three things, Excel, SQL, and R. Because for, so many, people, because for so many people doing analytics, not necessarily machine learning, but analytics, that's, that's all you need. That's all you need. Mm. Bingo, buddy. It, it, yeah. it's complicated like if you if you uh, if you study like boxing for example right like there, there's 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 a few basic punches like like jabs crosses and hooks right like that's that's like the, the mainstays and people you can complicate things by doing like karate kid bullshit, but like um <laughs> but like what what dave just described is like that's that's the basics <laughs> right it's, it's a staple those aren't going anywhere so yeah i mean like, like so focus on the core stuff man master the fundamentals that's how you get good. Mm. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, this myth is done and dusted for sure. I, yeah. Like if we spent more time just trying to identify the things that we should be learning when when we're on the job, that would be much easier. If we if we were always trying to okay, what how how are we going to get the value out of this? Do I need to learn something to to do that? Okay, I'm going to learn it now. Um, if we if we focus more on that, I think it'll be less about what tool are you learning and more how are you learning uh, how what are you learning and why are you learning it um i think that should be the sort of conversation that we should be having so yeah, i just had a, i just had a i just had a brainwave riffing on something ku said earlier data heretics university <laughs> we'll teach you just the things you actually need to know that'd be awesome yes. it would be perfect and it'll, it'll be global from day one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I mean, Dave, how many Excel users are there in the world? Estimates are like 700, 750 million. Right. Hmm. Okay. Pretty big audience, right? So that's it's a pretty big audience, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Excel can uh, do quite a bit, actually. Mm -hmm. Even I was surprised when I started looking into it. You know, I mean, I come from an Excel background too. I mean, because back in the early two thousands, it's kind of what you use for a lot of stuff, and like. And still, even even financial quants. I mean, back in the day, I mean, they do all the shortcuts with Excel, and it's absolutely killer beasts. Um, in Excel, I still wouldn't dare touch them to this day. A lot of the people I know, um, but 
you know, and Excel is an interesting one too, because I remember, you know, Harvard Business Review had a, a an article where it was like 80 to 90 percent of Excel reports have errors. So even just like teaching people, existing users, how to maybe do things better. I mean, that's 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 a wide mm -hmm. open market. So, oh yeah, I mean, it's a wide open market mm -hmm. versus the people who know like you know esoteric data science framework of the week in R or Python, right? Those come out every every day, it seems. So. Mm -hmm. So we've we've gone over the the sixty five minute mark. How how are we all feeling in terms of time? Like, I think it's things are getting darker in Dave's background. I, by the minute. I'm totally cool to go on. I just need to turn some lights on. That's all. Oh no, <laughs> all good. <laughs> At least we. Yeah, I think I think we're still good to go. I yeah. Everyone okay. else. Yep. We'll keep going. Um, all right. People, I'm just gonna turn on some lights. Cool. Yeah. Feel free, Dave. Okay. Yes. But. Let me. So the next, the next myth is actually another Dave myth. Or actually, let's let's jump to Joe's myth. I think we've talked about we've riffed on this quite a lot already. So data science is the sexiest oh, job yeah, in the 21st yeah. century. So <laughs> okay, so this yeah, is going to piss off all of LinkedIn. Um, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is well, this article. Of this, what's that? HBR? No, uh, yeah, yeah, HBR, HBR. This one, HBR, right? Yeah. 12, right. So they, they came up with this article, and I think it was appropriate for the time. Um, it was really good clickbait, nonetheless. Uh, um, but I think a lot of things have changed since then. So it, mm -hmm. even back then, it, it, you know, if you, if you read through the article, it's kind of like it was mainly because there's a shortage of data savvy people. I would, I would, I, I mean, I'm curious to know the data on um, how many data savvy people there are right now. At least people have come out of boot camps and similar in university. Because I know any university I see nowadays, it's like data classes are like the top classes everyone's taking right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, or top electives at least, and uh, boot camps are oversubscribed and so forth. But you couple this also with, um, you know, COVID uh, kind of put a uh, put a screeching halt to data science hiring. Um, I know Hacker Rank said that, you know, July uh, data science job postings are down 43% year over year. And that's that's below the IT average and below, you know, the average of, of just jobs in general. So it kind of makes you wonder what, what's going on there. Um, and so maybe, you know, my my comment on data science is a sexy job of the 21st century. So you're seeing like maybe micro trends like COVID that are impacting that. But I, I also think if you zoom out, um, it's more what we also what we just talked about. I think data science as a term may or may not. I, I, I don't know that it's really going to exist in any meaningful form in a few years um, because it's become so overloaded uh, with various job functions. Um, you know, I made the quip about you know you need to be able to lift boxes and stuff. I mean, I think these are five, that's part of the job description too uh, at some point. And it, but in all seriousness, it's it's like when it, when a when a job title means everything, it means nothing. So I, I think what you're going to see is basically the sexiest jobs of the 21st century are those that, um, uh, well, sexiest jobs are always ones that are going to help businesses make money. Um, you know, automation is going to be a big thing. Uh, and so maybe with respect to data science, I, I expect you're going to see job titles actually becoming um, bifurcated out and more specific. So like machine learning engineer, um, analytical engineer. That's that's one that uh, uh, Michael uh, Kaminsky came out with um, not too long ago. And and, and other variations, right? Because um, you have all these an analysts, actually. That's going to be a cool thing again. I remember back in the mid-2010s oh, cool. when the analysts, I mean, if you, if, so, if you said you're an analyst, I mean, people would just like run away from you in shrieking terror um, because they, they didn't want you around their kids or didn't want you near their company. Um, because like, uh, you know, it's like, wait, well, you're you're lame. You're just an analyst. I'm a data scientist. Like I do stuff. I don't know what I do, but I do things. Um, so, um, but but what people also realize is like, well, analytics isn't going anywhere either, and it's only going to continue to go somewhere as data grows and people. I mean, I, I have this old saying, at, you know, with my company, it's like, you know, we, we started our company um, with the impression that maybe you know companies were doing AI and had a need for that, and we come to find out most companies are barely doing BI, let alone AI. That's where it is right now. Yeah, and I have a pretty good sample of companies that say that. I think I would say pretty authoritatively at this point. So, mm. 
So like I said, I, I think it's it's not so much that data science is not a sexy job of the 21st century. I just think that the term data science itself is not going to be like a job to, in the 21st century to be sexy or unsexy. It'll just change. Mm. So love your thoughts. Yeah, to, to tag on to this myth as well. So data science is the sexiest job of the 21st century. Here's one from Dave, which is the business slash data analyst is a dead end job. I think these two are very related um, because it, it talks about the, yeah it talks about the the role and the name of the title and all all those sorts of things in terms of um, like what is what is data science versus analytics versus data engineering versus machine learning engineering and all of those different terms um, yeah I think these myths are two in one for sure I'd love to hear Dave's thoughts on on this stuff yeah this this came from some conversations I've had with folks on LinkedIn. Uh, a while back, I put up a post that says, look, getting a data scientist job is hard because of these inflated expectations like Joe's talking about, that you've got to know seven languages and you got to have 10 years of experience in all of them and blah, 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 blah. So I said, look, that's hard. What might be easier is to target an analyst position at a company that you want to work for and then get inside, do analytics day in and day out, because it's usually easier to transfer inside a company to different roles than to come in from the outside. And people were like, Dave, what are you talking about? That's a dead end job. Why would I want to do that? That's a bad job. I want a data scientist job. You know, and it's, it was like, well, look, if you take a look at the actual job descriptions, and I put this up on LinkedIn, you know, maybe a few weeks ago, where I looked at a bunch of Amazon senior business analyst positions, and they're quite technical. They need most of them need SQL skills, quantitative statistical analysis skills, scripting languages, starting to sound a little bit like a data scientist. So I think folks just need to re realign their thinking to say, look, data scientist is just a title. And as I've pointed out before, by the way, it's also not the most lucrative title, if that's what you're after. Data engineers tend to make mm -hmm. more, by the way, just so you know. So you should think about analytics. Do you want to do analytics? Do you want to analyze data in the context of the business to either raise revenue or lower expenses? If that excites you, does it really matter what the title is? I don't think so. Mm. Yeah. To add on to yeah. add on to this myth, also there's a SQL is a dead language. Oh, don't get um, me started! Don't get me started! And, <laughs> and I, this, I think all of these. This, are, gives, this gives Dave Tourette's here. You, you need to be very careful. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, it's funny looking on LinkedIn. I, th I think health's frozen over because it's like I, I'm starting to see people talk about things like Excel, SQL, um, analytics, like this. These were like forbidden topics back, like even a couple of years ago. Like you, if you talked about this, you were shunned from like the data science. I'm not even kidding. Um, like, you know, math PhDs, you know, a lot of my friends, they just like, you know, we'd have conversations and they would say, oh, well, but, but you, why do I need to know Excel? And why would you ever learn Excel? Like that, that's like almost seemingly beneath your capabilities. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just funny seeing the, you know, everything coming full circle now. These, these are cool again, because they're useful, Yeah. right? Yeah, and, I, and I'm in that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Koo. Oh, okay. No, I, I just want to add to that. I think I think we we still have to thank HBR for bringing attention to the I think to the to the field of data science and all this like, at the end of the day. But having said that, I actually I don't really agree with the sexiest job uh, anyway because so I was I was I usually share this in the, in the classes and that is I always equate uh data scientists right is like Cinderella like that. Okay. So why Cinderella is because um, if you look at C the whole Cinderella story, right? Most of, in in most most part of the story, she is actually doing cleaning. So like you know, like data scientists, you are always cleaning the cleaning the data like like ninety over percent of the time, not really eighty percent, but ninety over percent of the time. And then you look at Cinderella, right? Uh, she only get to uh, dance with the prince for about maybe two or three hours in the ball throughout the whole story, <laughs> probably about two or three hours. No, we we data scientists only present like two or three hours. No, in fact. Half an half an hour to the management, to the stakeholders. That's 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 what we get. That's that's the amount of attention that we get. So, but the good the good thing about Cinderella is that Cinderella after that live happily ever after. But we data scientists we, we repeat the whole process all over again. <laughs> uh, that's so, why it's a fairy tale. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we don't live happily ever after. That's why <laughs> we don't. But what we do is we enjoy that process. We enjoy that that. Yes, we do data cleaning and all this, but I think what we do is we we, we love we love that process of solution. 
trying to solution, uh, trying to provide a solution to a problem. We, we like that thinking process. We like that logical thinking and all this because it helps. It, it sort of put us in the in the flow that the uh, I can't pronounce his name, but you you know there's a book that that talks about flow and everything. Oh, else, yeah. Uh, the, the Russian. Yeah, yeah I, I, I yeah. can never pronounce his name. <laughs> but long story short, I think at the end of the day, uh, I agree, with Dave. I think at the end of the day, more importantly, is you should enjoy. You should know that this is the scope you're going for. You should enjoy the work. If you don't, and and of course, money is important. But I think to a certain extent money will reach to a point where hey i got this amount i'm happy with it it's, it's good enough to pay for whatever that i need and anything any dollars has added on top of that level will be more of a bonus rather but it's the scope that actually will engage uh will engage us more uh will engage the data scientists more uh. so at, at the end of the day I, I kind of feel that uh if you are in the field because of the money i can safely say you won't last long but if you're in the field for the scope, you'll last longer. Uh, not saying that you'll last long, but you'll last longer. <laughs> because yeah, that's still the human aspect of things. Somebody hit me up the other day asking about how can I get, you know, uh, how can I get a job in data science? I was like, well, what, what, you know, why do you want to do that? It's like, well, <laughs> it's a really high paying job. <laughs> it's like, I want to hear it like, makes a lot of money and stuff. I'm like, you know, I, I didn't say this, but I was like, you want to make a lot of money. I mean, just. You know, be an arms dealer or something. I mean, there's just more money in that, or you know, or go, just just be a know. software engineer. Oh yeah, just, 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 be, a, just be a software right. engineer. If you want to make a so, lot of money, just be a software yeah. engineer. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, it's, so it's it's, it's so interesting because I mean, money is the absolute wrong motivation. Uh, I would say for almost any career path. Well, maybe, but um, but yeah, and also I, I would say like you know, you're right. Who the uh, the data janitor part? Actually, my LinkedIn profile for a bit said data jan janitor because that's all I did for a long time, which is that work, and uh, that's the reality of it. Um, but there's you know there's a certain dopamine rush you get when you when you release a model and you keep checking its accuracy. It's like a video game, um, yes. and um, you know that's that's kind of what you strive for. But you got this ball and chain called work that prevents you from doing that all the time. So. <laughs> I remember goes, when I, I guess. so when I first started learning all the the machine learning methods and the data science and all those sort of things, like it really felt like I was playing a video game. Like I I would spend more time doing that than playing video games because it was quite addictive. Like learning new things, seeing if something works, testing different things, and finding out oh crap this this doesn't work. It's kind of like when you're playing a level and then you just keep trying until you you can beat the level mm -hmm. in a video mm -hmm. game. And it's I think if for people who are trying to get into the industry, if if you have that level of persistence and curiosity that you want to do that, um, you will be doing a lot of it because we learn a, like a host of different things throughout our careers in this in the data science and whatever data industry. Um, and I think if if you enjoy solving problems, um, trying to come up. Like I think creativity, like I was going to put my myths around creativity where people think that, oh, you're a data scientist, mm. there's no way you can be creative. Like, That's a really good point. Yeah. Do they ever, like, do they even go in the same sentence? Um, but I think the, the more creatively you can think, like that's where your best solutions come up because people haven't thought of it before or like it's a, an innovative take on someone's existing solution, but you just tweak it slightly to improve something that you didn't like before. So um, yeah, I think for, in terms of the sexiest job, it might not be, but for some people, it might be the most fulfilling job in that sense, where yep. if you like, it's, it goes back to understanding what you're, what you're about. So mm -hmm. I think for, for a lot of people out there, they, they do it really tough. Like they need, they need a job to pay the bills. And they, they often look at data science and they say, oh, this looks really interesting, but the, the money is really good. Maybe I should, I should do what I can to get into that. Um, so I think it's really admirable for people to actually use, use that as the, the contributing factor for whether they want to move in. But it's like Ku was saying, it, it's not going to last. Um, like, and if I was, I was going to make a joke about the Cinderella story. It's like, you know, at midnight when, when she transforms back into something, it's like, um, for us, for data scientists, it's like we have to leave the company before the thing goes into production and fails. <laughs> <laughs> or like, yeah. And then I, yeah, it was pretty interesting. 
And then something about a pumpkin, <laughs> like you ride out on a pumpkin or something like, yeah. Pumpkin yeah, you have to, eat that. Have, to, you have, to have to think further. You have to find yeah. a new job before you lay down the bad news and the last analysis that you did with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Like, what's what I mean, you're, you're, you're starting to, you're seeing this though, I think in, in data science um, uh, salaries, let me actually see if there's any data on this. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I've heard, I need to probably look at this a bit more carefully, but I know that there's, you know, definitely some, uh, um, Anecdotal stuff, and around we were talking about data, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, salaries are getting depressed just because I think tidal inflation too, right? You're stuffing. If everything's a, if everyone's a data scientist, then I guess we can start paying you less too because you're you're doing the same work as the BI uh, analyst over here, who's you know making half of you know mm. this other person mm -hmm. here. So that's yeah. You know, and, and part of it too is I think the title is just a honeypot uh, for companies too, where you can just lay out this data science, like, you know, yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah exactly. And everyone flocks and applies, and you can get a it's pretty smart, especially right now. Job market's full of, I think, a lot of uh, really smart, capable people who weren't on the job market uh, a few months ago. So, mm -hmm. so it's the opposite. You know, I, I know in my meetups when I'd run them, there was a we always do a who's hiring and who's looking. And it was always a negative unemployment rate, you know, informally, but it's like more people uh, were looking or more people were hiring than people were looking. And now it's, it's yeah, flipped. Around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Def definitely. But, but having said that, I think, but over, I think over here in Singapore, it's still the other way around, rather. It's still, it's still mm -hmm. more of the more uh, jobs versus the, the talents. Uh, I think mm -hmm. the only thing is that uh, because talent development takes takes a while, uh, and there's still many misconceptions and all this, so I think that will it, it will still take a while before it sort of uh reach equilibrium where they balance out uh each other and all. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, how's how is it in 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 Australia then? Is it the same or after the COVID mm. thing? Any Australia is a little bit different. So the market there's there's very well established established data science teams within the larger companies. Um, most of these guys, um, they all came from like either one of the banks and they all kind of spread out. So they're all mm. in like principal data scientist role or lead data scientist role managing their teams and they are very solid. Um, but I think the approach that we used to take in the bank was more of like a reverse pyramid structure. So it'd be like mm -hmm. you'd have all the senior people would make up the thickest layer of the reverse pyramid and they're at the top. And then you kind of have like increasingly thinner layers until you get one or two interns or like a very small amount of new people coming in where they would get like the full gamut of mentorship experience from all the experienced people. Um, and I think oh. that was how we were doing it for like two, three years. And then mm -hmm. um, like over time, people leave, the pyramid inverts. So now it just turns into a normal pyramid. And now you, in Australia, we see like quite a, quite a lot of uh, junior data scientists coming in, um, but there's not as many seniors around to mentor them. So there's like a, mm -hmm. it's sort of like, there's, there's a lot more jobs in data in Australia. Um, I think data scientists roles as junior roles are becoming increasingly rare. Um, mm -hmm. I think in Australia in general, there's not many companies which are actually doing like hardcore machine learning on the cloud in production, like the things which everyone thinks is data science. So most of the time, the data science that happens here is usually just plain analytics, trying to use the data in a, in a more difficult system, like say you're using um, Hadoop or Spark or whatever, whatever it is. But in the end, it's the same thing. Like you're, you're analyzing data. And I think people like we should, we should be driving this sort of initiative where we want people in data science to be able to analyze data because that's what, that's what we'll be doing. Like if you want to run experiments, or if you want to do machine learning, like you better hope that you've analyzed your data. Otherwise, like you, you'll have no idea what you're doing. And mm -hmm. like, yeah. So, 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 so that's me. Sorry, John. Oh, what's so, so, so that's uh, sorry. So, so that there's another myth where uh, you don't have to explore the data. You just have to take the data and then throw it at the machine machine learning model, and then that's and then the machine learning model will just spit something out. Out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> out. Yeah, it'll so spit something out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the model will spit something out. It <laughs> might suck, but it'll it'll do something. Right. Yeah. I think Danny, you get on a really good point, which is so many machine learning models that are popular, especially the stuff you see on LinkedIn, 
are arguably not data analysis. They're not. Hmm. So for example, hmm. if you were saying, look, hey, we implemented program A, did it produce a statistically significant result in terms of business KPI over here? How many machine not learning models are going to tell you that? Not many. I mean, mm. linear regression might, for example, mm. Koo. But, <laughs> but so many that are hot and people studied, they don't. So it's like it's almost like we're it's almost like we're getting a generation of folks that can build models, predictive models, whether regression or classification, and that's about it. But the vast majority of analytics, I would argue, day in and day out across the world, is not that. It's not that. Mm. Mm. So, 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 so that's the funny part, right? The funny part is that if you look at most of these programs or causes out there that says that, hey, if you, be, if you join us, you can become a data scientist. And then if you look at it, a right, majority of it is actually on machine learning, mm -hmm. which is, we all know, since you're in the field, we all know that that's not the case. Machine learning probably only from maybe 10% of the whole thing. The more important is what the more important is like what you mentioned about the, the analysis skill, being able to analyze the data first being able to ascertain whether the data quality is there before you even talk about machine learning, right? Before you talk about, uh, and, and machine learning after that is what? Implementation, whether yeah. you implement correctly, how you want to use the insights, uh, how you're going to use the insights correctly also and, and stuff like that. And I think given the fact that now, pu now the public or I guess gets a bit more data literate in that sense, they know that, hey, my data can do something, something like this. But they don't have to know what's what's inside the black box or whatever. If they start to pay pay more attention, they start to pay more attention to how you use the data. Uh, and that's where uh, pros and cons are. You, I mean, yes, we can use the data whatever we want, but as as the public education improves and increases and all this, that's where hey, we have to be a bit more mindful of how we use the data, how we generate the insights, and how we uh, use the insights. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, and I've told this story on LinkedIn in previous posts a while back. Mm -hmm. When I was working at Microsoft, I sold this totally awesome project to a GM. Like it was going to be in Azure, and it was going to use Spark, and it was going to be like just awesome. And he just looked at me. He's like, "Dave, cool. I'll write you a check. How do I know it's working? Tell me how do I how will I know what it's working?" And that's when mm -hmm. I said, "Let me get back to you on that." <laughs> Okay. <laughs> right. Did you get yeah. Random, yeah, there, I, I did get my check, but that's what led me to the that's what led me to the process behavior chart because it was this idea of like saying mm -hmm. how how would I know that if I had a KPI on a dashboard, if the thing was working, if the decrease was actually real. Hmm. So I'm just like, okay, well, that led me to do all kinds of to figure out what are the other analytical techniques at my disposal that would help me with that because. All of my machine learning knowledge did not help me answer that question. No, it wouldn't at all. That's just funny too. I mean, if you look back on a lot of the, uh, the I guess the classical methods now, right? So mm -hmm. statistical process control. Um, a lot of stuff you do is like, you know, it's kind of a lean sigma, uh, you know, six sigma junkie for a, a long time. Just, you know, so in that case, it's, um, it's pretty stats heavy. And, and that I would say is, is, being able to do that stuff is great. That adds value. Um, I think you can go overkill with it. Most certainly, certain companies have. But um, somebody asked me the other day, like, you know, I want, you know, I want to become a data scientist. Uh, what should I do? And, and you know, it, it was. I think it depends on how much you want to get into it. If you really want to make this your career, I, I would say step back and learn the fundamentals. That's math, actually, and that's where I might be a heretic against everybody else, but. Um, but I also come from a math background, so I'm really biased. But I think if you you need to know stats, <laughs> you need to know linear algebra, you need to know probability, and you need to know calculus. Like that, I don't. You can you can get away with not knowing these things, but there's a certain point where you're it, knowing these helps. Um, contrasting this, of course, to the fact that again, AutoML is you know doing its thing in the world and will make uh, that knowledge, I guess, less necessary in some areas and more necessary in others. So. But that gives you a good foundation just for analysis. Um, Cause like stats, if you know stats, can you do a lot with stats? Do you use stats every day? I do in some way, shape or form. So, but it's, it's, the, it's the basics, it's the fundamentals. Like you get that foundation, like everything else I think is just fairly easy. I got picked up machine learning pretty quick. You can just reading old crusty things like this just cause it was like, if you know the math behind it, it's like, it's not that hard. Um, so. 
and then translating that, then the question is, okay, so the, well, then, then you know, the question is, oh, do I, do I learn programming next? My take on this is if, again, if you're taking, you know, the, the Joe school of data heretics, um, you know, you're going to learn math and then you, you, you learn programming, but you're going to learn programming to the extent that it's applicable to something. Because learning programming just for the hell of it is actually a really good way to forget programming. I, I've seen people do this all the time. And it's like, um, if you don't have a problem that you're trying to solve, the best way to learn something is when you have something to apply it to. That just goes in general. So if you're trying to learn programming, um, pick something. It could be machine learning. At least you have like a use case to learn programming on. Uh, learning Python or R in a vacuum, I would say, is like a great way to um, like totally forget it in six months. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, that's my tangent. So. Yeah, definitely. I think <laughs> definitely experiential learning. Like you need to have some something that you want to accomplish with whatever you're learning. Otherwise, you're just learning for learning's sake, which is cool yeah. as well. But I think we're we're in this industry where like you you can learn different things, but if you're not going to apply it, you have to think of the trade-off, like the time spent, the energy spent, the attention that you've that you've used to learn something that you're not going to use. That takes its toll over time, and oh, like, it does. It's not sustainable. Yeah, I haven't used yeah, COBOL in 150 years, according to Joe, so I don't remember any of it. <laughs> I'm sure it would come back on riding a bike, though. <laughs> um, actually, Sharik in the audience uh, asks a, a good related question. For a new student in data science, should I focus more on learning advanced statistics or machine learning? I, I think this is an interesting one because, OK, soapbox for a second. Um, machine learning itself has become sort of, uh, I think, uh, fuzzy, right? Uh, machine learning back in the day used to be something where you're teaching a program um, to learn from experience and so forth. Uh, machine learning uses elements of advanced statistics depending on the type of algorithm that you're implementing. Um, but machine learning or advanced statistics, it's, it's an interesting question, I would say. It also depends on what the word advanced means. So if you're, if you're talking about um, something beyond basic stats, it's definitely applicable. Um, but even just the basics, like um, how do you know it, it, which group did better than the other one, right? Mm -hmm. That's a question you're going to ask a lot in business. You should know how to answer that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, knowing oh. you know like, advanced gamma distributions, I mean, you could learn that stuff. I don't really... Stuff that has a way of popping up, though, like maybe knowing, um, you know, some more probability, but knowing like Markov models actually comes up, I think, more often than I would care to think. I always see them, and maybe it's because I am wired to see them. But um, but things like that, or like queuing theory, for example, stuff like that, where like if you're dealing with um, like call centers and calls come in, like for traffic. So there's underlying things that you can do, but that's not necessarily machine learning. And, and so I would say, uh, the answer is both. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think you hit it right on the head, Joe. I mean, it really depends upon advance. And as you mentioned earlier, it also depends on the business that you're talking about. What is advanced and yeah. what is not? I would argue, based on my experience, and take it as one data point, is that if you look at most of the analytics that's done in most of the companies every day around the world, you don't really need that much statistics and you don't really need that much machine learning. You'd be surprised how little you actually need day in and day out. For example, OLS, linear regression, great. The one thing that you need to know is that most of the time, da business data violates a couple of those assumptions. So how do you mm -hmm. handle that? That's one of the things you'll need to know. Um, no. Econometrics is great for this because the econ econometric data exhibits the same qualities as business data. It's auto-correlated. Usually you don't have a randomized experiment. You got all these uh, violations that they take care of. I wouldn't consider that particularly advanced personally um, you'd be surprised at how little you actually need to be an effective analytics professional at most companies day in and day out. I know Warren mm. Buffett even, like he said, like he, um, like he memorized uh, Pascal's triangle and that was more to figure out like kind of more, more binomial probabilities and stuff. But like, that's about as advanced as he got. And, but he also made a comment too, like, you know, if you have an IQ over like 130, like you, you don't need like the extra points. So and <laughs> he's, he's the kind of person who can, yeah, he can do like really complicated stuff in his head. Um, and yet, you know, I, I don't think he's known for being like a killer data scientist. So I would say, yeah, to your point, just pick what's effective and mm. do that.
Yeah, because so you can get really you can, good business. I mean, you can get really far in terms of like machine learning algorithms with relatively simple algorithms like boosted decision trees and random forests mm. if you do the right feature engineering, which usually requires some business expertise. Mm, you don't. Yeah. Somebody has, actually asked a question about feature engineering earlier in the discussion too. Like, what are some ways to go about doing that? Uh, um, it's that's Let me see that's, a, that's, a, that's a that's 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 a bunch of dark arts. Um, yeah. we can get into that if you want. <laughs> I think maybe in a, that's, in a that's, separate that's, session. Which, that, that's witchcraft. Yeah. Just, yeah. Um, once, once Skynet figures that out, you all need to come live with me in Montana in the hills. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think I'd like to add one more thing quickly about the statistics side of the, for new students, especially in the data science and the machine learning. Um, I think when, when you think of statistics, it's, you, you have to think about the use cases of when you're going to use it on the job. So one of them would be trying to identify whether an AB test was successful, whether one of the groups actually has a significant uplift over another. That's like the, the textbook thing that we do quite a lot when we're, when we're working in the industry. Um, another one would be time series. So if you're trying to do some forecasting, um, you have to look like think about okay, are my things autocorrelated? Are there um, is my is my data even stationary? Uh, what's the word? Station. I can never stationary. Think of stationary. Stationary. Yeah, like all of all of those little things. Um, they're fundamentals, and like we should definitely have more focus on those ones. Um, in terms of, I also think of for probability and distributions is really important. Yeah. Um, when we think of like real world phenomena, which is essentially what we're capturing in the data, like we're, we're looking at events that are happening over time. Um, and these events, they follow certain types of natural distributions that occur in the world. So there's like, of course, there's a normal distribution, there's things for hitting time, the time to arrival, the number of occurrences um, for, I think it's like a Poisson distribution, but all of those sorts of things there, those are the sorts of mathematics that I think people should understand better. Similar with the Markov chains as well. Like when we think of the graph analytics and the different things that we do within there, um, it's mm -hmm. purely just thinking through conditional probability essentially. Um, and I think those things are like, they're, they're not covered a lot and people want to dive straight into, oh, I need to learn the linear algebra for um, the deep learning for the tensors or whatever yeah. it is. Um, <laughs> for the tensors. Yeah. yeah for the tensors. The tensors. Well, what, what is a tensor? I don't know what a tensor is. <laughs> like, is it, it's like, actually my, under um, <laughs> my, uh, my um, understanding uh, is just like an it's, it's, like end dimensional it, it, array. Or no, oh, I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. So they've, uh, it's just part of the part of the keyword list that I have somewhere around is tensor that's there. I need to just go and <laughs> do more research on it. I haven't, haven't got I haven't got to that yet. But I, I agree with you, Danny. I, I kind of feel that uh, there's a lack of understanding the first principles, which Joe Reese, Joe always mentioned about going back to, and there is the understanding the the mathematics, the the distribution and all. And I think we kind of see that more often these days because of COVID, right? So a lot of people start like, hey, I'm collecting all this data. I start doing forecasting and all this. But have you even maybe start exploring the data and understand how even the data is collected in the first place? Is it really, I mean, if you, if you, if you, do forecasting using these certain models and all these, you, you have to understand what's the underlying assumption on the data, how the data is collected and all. And like especially um I think over here over here in Singapore when we announce when we announce the number of people affected and all this is the the first we, we don't get the data when the person is affected. We get the data only when the person is tested positive. So that's, that's that kind of difference. And then you try to use it to go and do forecasting on how many people will get affected when the pandemic is going to end and all this. It doesn't make sense anymore, right? It doesn't make sense anymore. So so I think, again, at the end of the day, the fundamentals, the, the data collection, the mathematics and all this. And that is something that I stress a lot uh, as well. So I, I agree with Joe and I believe that I think the first thing I'll go for is the mathematics, is to understand the maths. Because the maths, if you look at it, if you spend time to understand it, right, uh, it, it returns a lot back to you. It makes you understand what are the assumptions behind the mathematics, what are the uh, rules that are sort of set up uh, and, and all this. And to Dave's point about the, um, 
when you do modeling, there's also that assumptions as well, like especially linear regression, you've got this autocorrelation, you've got multicollinearity, you've got uh, homoscholasticity and, and, and stuff like that. You There's no way you can just take the data and just throw it in. If you do that without checking the assumptions and all, you you, you got to, you got to, you'll, go, you'll be waiting for something to happen, put it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and this this will be something oddly enough heretical mm -hmm. the math helps it absolutely does mm -hmm. however i would argue strictly speaking it's not actually required it's mm -hmm. not it's not required mm -hmm. uh, and i'll i'll use an example social scientists use statistics all the time very few of them have had, had advanced training in mathematics and statistics what they're taught essentially is the concepts What's heteroscedasticity, for example? Do you have it in your data, yes or no? This is what you do when you do have it. So and the reason why I wanna bring this up is because there's a lot of folks that are in the business world that are probably interested in using data to affect positive business outcomes. And they're like, oh, I'm not gonna go back to school and learn linear algebra. And you don't have to necessarily. Okay, it yeah. helps, don't get me wrong, it totally helps. But if you wanna use some of these tried and true data analytics, analytics techniques, if you understand the core concepts and you check everything, if you check all the assumptions and you correct where you need to, you don't necessarily need to know all the underlying mathematics. You could learn them later if you want, but you don't have to. I just want to make sure people don't come yeah, away totally, from it. Yeah, I agree. Oh my God, I got to go back to school and get a math degree. Before I can do it. No, you certainly don't. That'd be a total waste of your time for the most part. Like focus on what you're good at. It's like an old CEO told me once, like, you know, when I ask for the time, don't tell me how to make a watch. Okay, just tell me the time. <laughs> Uh, so, that's an old consulting job. That, that, that was probably, yeah, but it was like also like, I think when I was coming out, you know, was it my first job and, you know, as an analyst this way back in the early 2000s and uh, yeah, I'd come in there like, you know, gung ho showing off how cool I am and how smart with all these fancy stats. And he's like, I really don't care about that. Like, right. so like, what, what are you trying to get at? You know, I'm, I'm, like time's really short. So what do you, what's your point? Um, and that taught me a really good lesson, actually, just kind of like shut up and like, and this comes back to communication, like learn to get to the point really quickly. Um, don't spend your time elaborating. Business people don't care how you came up with a model. As shocking as that sounds, um, they really don't uh, for the most yeah. part. So don't don't get into the gory details. Uh, I would say if you can if you can explain what you're doing in about a sentence or two, awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I'm even like this anymore. Frankly, I'm more on the business end of things right now because I have a business and that's kind of how that goes. So um, I, I, <laughs> it's weird. So, and and again, like with, with, uh, with you know, I can definitely dive into technical stuff, but even with technical people, I'm, I'm pretty short. I'm like, tell me what's going on, right? Like I can dive into the nitty gritty as much as you want, but it's at the end of the day, um, you know, even if a, if a person like me is telling you to get to the point, a person who doesn't know the details is going to be a lot more confused and frustrated when you don't get mm. to the point in about five sentences. So yeah. that's a good skill to learn. Just learn how to wrap it up real quick. Hmm. Yeah. What's, What's, that about communication? What's that? Communication's key, man. I keep telling you. Yeah. Uh, Jasmine, Jasmine, sorry if I'm completely crucifying your name. Um, hi guys. I am an aspiring data scientist and would like to have some form of guidance to, Oh, thank you. <laughs> No worries, got you back. Start learning on my own. <laughs> okay, I mean, um, myself to be all over the place. We've actually this is great. Good timing. All right. So, aspiring data scientists, I would like to have some form of guidance on your own. Okay. Yes. Mm. Um, this question is blocking both Joe and Ku at the moment, <laughs> um, but I think. <laughs> In a nutshell, one of one of the things that I usually tell my people when they when they come to me, like, oh, I'm just starting. Where do I go? Is there a formal learning path, or is that do I need to go on a program, or is there anything um, that I can do? I usually say try and try and join a community. So some sort of community, whether it's on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Slack, it, it almost doesn't really matter. Um, I think getting different people's perspectives and trying to find out exactly um, the different ways that they've learned before you try and experiment on your own is usually a good strategy. Um, of course, you can just jump straight into whatever program you feel that you want to try as well and save the time from interacting with a lot of people. But what we're seeing here is that probably um, our community within LinkedIn is very interesting where we just kind of like, someone posts something, we just chime in the comments and you learn so much just by reading other people's comments. So um, I think, yeah, try and, 
put yourself out there, try and start, start, start reading more of the posts that we're, we're posting on LinkedIn. There's lots of great content from loads of different people, not just us in the heretic space, but from, from people who are trying to like Eric, for example, is doing a really great job in trying to share yeah. some of his knowledge also. Um, but yeah, I think try to get a wider exposure to what's going on before diving in or being dogmatic about learning a certain language or different things like that. Um, it's all about the, your, your journey and you should focus on, on just, mm. yeah, making the most of it. Okay. Um, I think we've, we've gone like over one hour, 45 minutes. So in, since Joe was talking about wrapping it up and everything, I think I'll, <laughs> I'll start to do the honors for this one. What we're going to do is let's just quickly blast through all of the myths that we've busted today. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up from here. So myth number one, you don't become a data scientist after a program or after several courses. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, busted. You, yeah. you, yep, you need consistency and hard work over a long period of time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next one. If you have data, you can do data science. Busted. B busted. Yeah. If it is not complicated mathematics, it is not data science. Yep. We, <laughs> so busted. We busted that for the last <laughs> half an hour. So. Okay, so let's start the R and Python ones. You can't use R in production, only Python is allowed. Yep, definitely busted. Data scientists should be able to write production quality code. It's a nice to have, but it's, it's not a hard requirement. Uh, if you're not doing machine learning, you're not doing data science. Busted. Yeah. Yep, busted. Business business slash data analyst is a dead end job. Yes, we also oh, talked about. Busted. Yep, busted. 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 Along with this one, this one is also busted. <laughs> um, uh, I think SQL is a dead language is also busted because most companies busted. have their data in some sort of database. And how do you oh, get yeah. data from a database? Use SQL. Use SQL. Um, Python is better than R for machine learning. I think we didn't actually bust this one formally, but I think you guys get the point. Like it's, yeah. There's, I think Koo pretty no... much said it was busted. Yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the three lines of code was just the one line. <laughs> yeah, okay. We bust that one. Uh, we bust the Python is easy to learn. I think Python is easy to learn if you want to get the basics, but if you want to be able to use it for something, that's another story. Um, R is hard to learn. Um, I think it's only for people who haven't actually tried to learn R, so they just say that it's hard to learn. It's actually really easy to learn. I think everyone should try it. Um, yes. Oh, yeah, we busted this one as well. Uh, and data science is all about tools. Yeah, definitely busted. And the last one, people skills aren't important for data scientists. Definitely busted. Ooh, definitely busted. Definitely Way. busted. Way yes. busted. So, <laughs> I think that that brings us to the conclusion of the first Data Heretics show, podcast, LinkedIn Live, YouTube video, whatever we want to call it. Um, <laughs> all the content I, forms. Yeah, all, all, all of them. I think <laughs> I think all four of us had a really great time. We, we enjoy talking with each other. I hope everyone in um, viewing on LinkedIn or wherever you guys are watching it from had a great time also. Um, we, we didn't really go through too many comments today. Sorry. I think we... We had too many myths to bust, but we'll. I think over time we'll go through as many of those comments and try and ping different questions. I know there were a few questions around like different links that that we could share or different books or different things like that. So we'll definitely follow up on those things. Um, but yeah, I, again, I'd like to thank all of all of the special guests today um, for for your time. We we ran like almost an hour over the allocated hour, but I think that was for the better and we had so much fun i think we yeah, yeah. definitely definitely again. Thanks. Yeah, we definitely. Next, when's the next one i think yeah. um oh we'll we'll be on again very soon i think um <laughs> like i i think maybe once a month might be a really good cadence for this one because we've got like everyone's busy and we've all got all sorts of different initiatives that we're tackling i think people yeah. like a healthy dose of heresy every now and then i think if you have too often you end up being um more like us and almost like conspiracy theorists so maybe <laughs> yeah. yeah or like like info wars so yeah like <laughs> like so as much as we'd like to do once every week i think that might be too much for yeah. for everybody but you can let us know in the comments if if that's what you want because then we'll we'll see what we can do but yeah. um yeah i'd like to thank everyone again um, and thank you so much for tuning in today. And I hope you guys have an awesome day wherever you are, wherever you are in the world. Please stay safe. 
um, and take care. Goodbye. Cool. Thanks, everybody. See you. Bye. Thank you.